again and again in peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Help us, save us, have mercy on us, and keep us, O God, by thy grace. Behind your remembrance, our most holy, most pure, and most blessed, glorious Lady, the Atrophus, and ever Virgin Mary, with all the saints, let us commit ourselves and one another and all our life unto Christ our God.
praise, O Lord, who loves mankind, and by thy resurrection has delivered all from the bonds of enemies, thereby have we been the living, and we cry unto thee, remember us also in thy kingdom.
Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever. O Lord, save my ears and hearken unto
life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Ye brethren, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod of bread, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubim before a shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went off always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. And thy spirit, wisdom, follow in the fourth tone, and thy bones proceed prosperously and be king because of truth and meekness and righteousness. Thou art tormented. The 
signs all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fenced, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Hey, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now it came to pass as they went, that Jesus entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Martha was comforted about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath not me to serve alone? Bid her therefore, and then she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. One thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. It came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the wound that bare thee in the paps which thou hast sung. But he said, Gay rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep Broken hearts, we fall down before thee, and groaning. 
healing we cry unto thee. Heal the sicknesses, heal the passions of the soul and body thy servants. The archpriest Seraphim, the priest Alexander, the holy deacon Leonid, Mother Spagina, Pisenia, Maria, Holm, Sophia, Holm, Nina, Adrian, Mary, Lydia, Botini, Andrew, Larissa, Larissa, Tamara, John, Nina, Paul, Nicholas, Dimitri, Innocent, Lydia, Leah, Jordan, Josephine, Ludmila, and Nicholas, and pardon them, for thou art carnarded all their transgressions, voluntary and involuntary, and quickly raise them up again from the bed of sickness. We pray thee, hearken and have mercy. especially the Christian faithful of Syria and across the Middle East. The Lord God will send down upon them every spiritual weapon to endure their tribulations, and that he will grant that peace which passes all understanding upon the region, and throughout the whole world as a foretaste of his heavenly kingdom. Save us, have mercy on us, 
mercy on us and keep us, O God, from our prayers. Wisdom. That being always guarded by thy might, he may ascribe glory unto thee, to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages.
and mothers in the hills of the north, holy patriarch of Moscow, Lord of Russia, our command guarded out the Trinity Saint Sergius Lampron, and our Lord, the very most reverend and Nicolai, metropolitan of East of America, New York, first hierarch of the Russian Church abroad, may the Lord God remember his kingdom, always, now and ever, and then the wages of the age. May the Lord God remember in his great mercy this our land. Our civil authorities and armed forces and their commands are spread throughout the world. May the Lord God remember also in his great mercy the Russian lands, his Orthodox people, in the homeland, and the end of the Aspera. May the Lord God remember also in his great mercy the many lands, his Orthodox people, and the suffering there. May the Lord God have mercy upon them, save them unto the ages of the age of.
penance that is asked of the Lord. <laughs> in a good defense before the judgment seat of Christ, let us ask. Holy to remembrance, our most holy, most pure, most blessed, glorious Lady Theotokos and ever-Virgin Mary with all the saints, let us commit ourselves and one another in our life unto Christ our God.
most holy, most pure, most blessed and glorious lady that they all draw calls, and ever Virgin Mary.
Thou save me to partake without condemnation of thy most pure mystery. Under the mission of my sins, life everlasting. Amen. I thy this go to the Son of God, receive me today as a communicant. For I will not cease the mystery to thine enemies, nor will I give thee a kiss as a Judas. Like a thief do I confess thee. Remember me, O Lord, in thy kingdom. Now that the communion of the most pure mysteries give me for judgment and combination, O Lord, to the healing of soul and body. Amen.
save thy people and bless thine inheritance.
dark and menacing right now. I want to see if our, our team here is being menaced by electronics. Are we good? We're good now. Brothers and sisters, I greet you from afar. We were just discussing the problem of transitioning back to normal time, a particular problem here in America. Not all countries follow this practice. And I was mentioning to our congregation here in Washington, D.C., the problem is we gained an hour in the morning and we felt that we were heroes. We felt so blessed. And then now in the afternoon, when darkness comes on us much earlier, we're going to feel the penalties of this time change. It's actually fitting that this time change and what it offers us and what it takes away from us is symbolic of the gospel today. We, many of us have heard this wonderful parable told by our Lord, a parable of judgment, Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus has a name. Lazarus is also tied to the resurrection will be also a Lazarus who will receive a form of the resurrection before Christ's passion. Lazar is a name in Hebrew which means to be taken up and raised up. The rich man doesn't have a name. This is biblical. To be without a name in biblical parlance is to be under a hard judgment because it means you're one degree away from being forgotten. You're one step closer to oblivion. And this is why in our sacred tradition, the idea of memory, sacred memory, vechnaya pamyat, eonina, that keeping of memory, the reading of names. Many of you submitted your names. Many of you have books of names of relatives which read every liturgy. Some of you, by the way, are wondering, where do the priests go? Why do they vacate the altar and disappear for a time? One could be forgiven to presume that we were sitting down resting. Rather, no. We're actually busy cutting the commemoration from the small loaves of those names, reading them, 
and honoring them symbolically with particles of bread, which are offered in this liturgy and all liturgies, which are offered around the central offering of the Lamb. And while they do not become the Eucharist, they're as close to the Eucharist as you can be. And then at the end of the liturgy, which you just saw, all of those particles are then sent into the chalice. They go down into the chalice and they become, through the sacred blood of Christ, they become in communion with that mystery. For us, memory is very, very important. It brings us all together. It keeps us together as one community. And it's this notion of memory which takes us across the divide. In today's parable, Father Abraham, told by our Lord, says, when asked, send someone to rescue my brothers, the rich man has relatives. And he's told in hard language, they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, who are they going to listen to? And he says, there's a great divide between us. And he asks again the rich man who's in pain and torment, then please send someone to them. Someone, the Lord replies, Father Abraham that is, replies, even if it's someone risen from the dead. But he says, sadly, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, why would they listen to anyone even from the dead? They will not hear even one from the dead. It's very clear that this gospel has been concretized and set down after the resurrection of Christ. This gospel has been formed in the knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it's clear with the name Lazarus, the unnamed rich man, it's very clear that the one who will cross over the great divide and the word great divide for Hebrews is none other than Sinai, the Red Sea, the crossing and the splitting of the water, the making of dry land, which is wetland, which is under the bottom of the sea. This miracle of liberating the Hebrew people, that's implied in the gospel. There is one man who will rise from the dead, who will cross that great divide, who will come back to all of the people who can't hear Moses and the prophets. That's us, by the way. And that great miracle actually happens to someone early, not 30 years after the resurrection of Christ. His name, Paul. And in Galatians, he gives us his testament. I'd like to read it to you again, because it bears repeating. He says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. But by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. He's repeating the very words of Abraham in the gospel. But, and this is the all important adversative, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Absolutely not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Here St. Paul is talking to his disciples, to the people that he's built up. Indirectly and through the walk of time, he's speaking to you also. Even though this church is not named for St. Paul, this church is under a different protection. He speaks to you every single Sunday because we read him every Sunday so that he can make you his disciples also. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Paul admits that he's a sinner. For I, through the law, of died to the law that I might live to God. One more time. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is St. Paul on the way to his judgment. 
This is St. Paul on the way to his martyric death. He understands what's happening to him. St. Paul, and why we teach him every Sunday, as I mentioned, is called the theologian. You could also say John, who is also called John the theologian. The two of them together form the great bookends of our theology. St. Paul can speak to us because he enjoys a gift. He is in what is called the unitive state. It is Dionysius, St. Dionysius, who gives us this model that there are three levels of our spiritual life. The unitive, which is the perfection. The illuminative, which is when you finally get the light and you see it, you finally realize it. And then for the bulk of us, there's the purgative state, which is the business of repenting of our sins. To be in purgation means you do see something. You see something wrong and you're busy correcting it. However, sometimes sin is strong in us. God have mercy on us. The gift of the, of the illumination is, is that we actually start to overcome our sins. We start to actually touch holiness. And then finally, the unitive state, you have the full power and union of the Holy Spirit working in you. It's clear from the church tradition, St. Paul understands all three states very well. His purgative phase is when he persecuted the church and killed Christians. His illuminative phase is when he has his great conversion and will spend several years in instruction. He had to become a catechumen. He had to go down to the bottom. Paul was a top teacher in the Jewish ways. He goes down in humility and becomes a mere student in Christian ways. He learns from the successors of the apostles. He will make future, future bishops successors of the apostles. Timothy being the one that we know best of all in the scriptures. And then finally, through teaching, preaching, suffering, leading, guiding, we know that he comes into the unitive way. This letter from the Galatians, I believe, is from this period of the unitive way. He sees his life for what it is. He realizes he is an apostle, but he also notes that he's a sinner. And he also notes that no matter what, that he's actually conformed his life into Jesus. And here's the important part for us. Jesus has actually conformed himself into Paul. Jesus has come into Paul. Why is this so important for us, if I may add, and to briefly sum up a problem that was mentioned here last week. In our world today, we are taught through the teachings of Martin Luther, that German Catholic Augustinian recollect reformer, that works are dead. Only faith. In fact, we are saved by faith alone. He dared to even add the word to scripture in his translation. He added the word alone. He was corrected by other reformers who said to him, Dr. Luther, the scriptures do not say alone. This is a famous story in his life. And they challenged him. These others were good in their Greek. And they said, there's no Greek word alone in the text here. And it is reported that Martin Luther said, it will be alone because I'm Martin Luther. And he insisted on that going into a translation or at least into a catechism, which has led us to the belief in the West that works don't mean anything. However, it's not entirely true. St. Paul said the works of the law. He said the works of the law in Galatians. He says the works of the Old Testament are finished now. He does not say that the works of the New Testament are finished. No, actually what's happened is the works of the New Testament are just beginning. By the time Paul goes to his death at the end of this, the year, perhaps 69 or 70 AD, the works of the church are expanding into the world. And today I would like to add the works of the Lord are not finished, not at all. Because here we're taking stock of a special work of Jesus, a special work of the Holy Trinity, which is the miracles that will come through his mother. Here we have a special icon today, the icon dedicated to people who are suffering, that God actually would present to you his mother, who would be the joy for you who are suffering. 
that through the works of the Lord, through coming together in the Lord, actually what was revealed is, here we are, the saints. It's called the cult of the saints in the West. Sadly, this is something that Dr. Luther, Martin Luther, was much opposed to. Fortunately, in his upbringing, he had a very cross notion of saints. And so he turned against this part of the tradition. He also turned against bishops too, by the way. Perhaps he was justified in that. You were supposed to laugh, but I hope the bishops, but our bishops are not supposed to hear that. But for some reason, he could not see that the work of the saints through the ages was in fact a sacred and holy work. And therefore you will see Lutheran churches to this day, they don't have saints names unless they're scriptural. I've seen a St. Paul Lutheran church. I've seen Hope. I've seen uh, uh, Hope Faith. I've seen Faith Lutheran Church. I've never seen Love Lutheran Church. That one didn't catch on. I've seen all of the St. John, St. Paul, St. Mark, and then it stops as if holiness came to a ceasing moment at the end of the New Testament. And that's the condition of the Reformed world. They can't see the work of the church going forward in a sacred work. For us, we in abundance want to affirm, especially through this icon, that when, even when we're suffering and we're in sorrows, actually we have a protector. We have a protectress. We actually have ears that are hearing us. We have saints and the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, is the most excellent of all the saints, the first of all the saints. And so, joy of those who sorrow, gosh, it's a relevant theme. It's a relevant theme today since there's a lot of misery in our world. It's a relevant theme since there's so much doubt in our world. It's a relevant practice to call upon joy of those who sorrow at a time when we're not exactly sure what new war is going to break out for us in 2022 or 2023. And so finally we come back to St. Paul. We who are, many of us are in the purgative state, and I count myself in the purgative state. I'm trying to become better. I'm trying to become part of Jesus' illumination. It's good for us to realize that the works of the church have never stopped. It's good for us to realize that the activity of the saints, it's alive. It's good for us to come back to the very ancient tradition. The Old Testament has no power to save us or justify us. We are actually saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the faith that we have received in our baptism is perhaps, indeed it is, it's the most precious thing that we've ever received in this world. Take good care of it. Call upon the saints. Seek out the joy, even in the sorrows. And may God have mercy on us. The blessings of the Lord be upon you. Please grace and love towards mankind, always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, O Christ, our God, and sure hope. Glory be to thee. Jesus Christ, our true and living God, who is risen from the dead, through the prayers of the most holy name, taught us and ever Virgin Mary, through the power of the joy of those who sorrow, and through the prayers of thy holy, and through the power of the life, creating and precious cross, and through the prayers of the holy Baptist John, the patron of this temple, and through the prayers of the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, the twelve, the seventy, and through the prayers of the great ecumenical teachers, Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, and John the Christ, and through the prayers of the Holy Heart, John of Shanghai, the founder of our community, and through the prayers of the most holy martyrs, Sebastina of Grace, and Patrius of Armenia, Arethas, and the other martyrs who have been given. Number 4,299, 
I remember the blessed El Sabah, the king of Ethiopia, the venerable son, the abbot and the martyrs, St. Lydia and her two daughters, and St. Magorius, the abbot, and St. Theophil, the hermits of the caves of Kiev, and the venerable Aretha and Sisios, the venerable St. Athanasius, the patriarch of Constantinople, the venerable John the Recluse, of the Biscoff Caves and St. Zosimus, the elder of Siberia, and remembering the new higher martyrs, Lawrence, the bishop, the Alexis, the priest, and the martyr Alexis, the venerable Aletha, and the new higher martyrs, John and Nicholas, the priests, the new martyr Peter, and the venerable George, the confessor, and remembering thy holy ancestors, Joachim and Alan, of all thy saints, have mercy upon us, O God, and save us. For you are good and love mankind. Sisters, I have the privilege of offering the first announcement today. Father Victor, pardon me for cutting in front of you. Speaking of holy works, one of the most important holy works in the life of Christianity is the sacrament of matrimony. And next Sunday, we have the privilege, the pleasure, the blessing to unite in holy matrimony Leah Cooley and Charles Rogers. Ah, but that's not enough. The following Sunday, we're doing it again in the case this time with Charity and Nathan. So St. John's is now becoming the house of love in Christ. So one more time, sacred works lead us to salvation. God have mercy on us. That was a long marriage announcement there. That's okay. The more information we have, the better. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, uh, uh, we, uh, let me see, what do we, yeah, this uh, Tuesday evening, Metropolitan Jonah will continue his series on Orthodoxy online. You will uh, get the link in the, this week's, this week at St. John's email, which I will send this afternoon. Uh, if you're not subscribed to our general mailing list on emailing list, please do so. It's very easy to do. All you need to do is go to the website, stjohndc.org, uh, scroll down and you'll see subscribe. And we have three different uh, subscription 
uh, opportunities, the general list, the sisterhood list, and the once a month parish life uh, list. Um, the Wednesday, November 9th, we will serve a Malayan and a Kafist to the Most Holy Theotokos at 7 uh, p.m. Uh, and next, next weekend's schedule is the regular weekend schedule. Um, our, we are continuing with our raffle. Um, first prize is a week uh, in a, a condo uh, in St. Martin's in the Caribbean. Just think. The, the chances of winning are very good because, you know, this is not the mega mega ball or whatever it's called, uh, power ball, power ball with the mega prize. Uh, we were your chances are one in five billion. Th this will be one in maybe hopefully one thousand. So your chances are good. And just imagine spending a week this winter in the Caribbean, sunning yourself instead of clearing your driveway of snow. We will be delivering, we will be di distributing uh, uh, packets of holy myrrh in cotton, one per family because we need to keep enough to hand out to the Sl uh, Slavonic uh, people who come to the Slavonic uh, liturgy. If there's more left over, there will probably will be and you need more, just come to me and uh, either today or any time this week, uh, I'll be glad to give you uh, more. Uh, we had a wonderful pilgrimage to Holy Trinity Monastery last weekend. Um, <clears throat> all the pilgrims in both buses we needed, there was a, the demand was so, so great that we needed to rent a second bus, but every single uh, pilgrim was able to hold the Hawaiian Mer streaming icon in their lap for about 10-15 minutes. And uh, when we went to serve the first Panihida, uh, the first memorial service at the grave of our brother Jose Munoz Cortez, the uh, faithful custodian of the Montreal Merstrining icon, of which the Hawaiian icon is basically a continuation. Um, Father Nictarios came with the uh, icon on his uh, neck, holding it in a carrying case. And when I removed the icon from the carrying case, we could see that the, uh, the, the cloth uh, frame of the icon, the bottom, was like a balloon f filled with water. And when I took the icon from the bottom in my hands, my, literally the myrrh just streamed down my arms, hands and arms, and when we put the uh, icon on the analogia next to the grave of Brother Jose. Um, the murder just, just spurted out of the cloth covering of the analogia, and you, you'll see it in the photographs that I sent. The whole front of the uh, analogia was wet with myrrh. Father Damien saw this, all the pilgrims who were there were also witnesses of this. And Father Nictario said that the icon never streams as much more as it does when the uh, icon comes to the grave of Brother Jose. Uh, last Monday and Tuesday, we were, the pilgrims were all very, very tired. It was an exhausting trip. In many ways, we got home about two o'clock in the morning. So Monday was a shot for those of us who didn't have to work, at least were able to rest. Uh, but so Wednesday, I began writing an article on our trip and just as I place the last dot on the last paragraph I hear the doorbell ringing the postman comes and I see it as a package from France from a gentleman I don't know and I open the package and there are four copies of a, of a service to brother Jose Munoz Cortez uh, in Church Slavonic the entire service printed on glossy paper and really uh, through three colors. I don't know, I'm going to try to find out more about this, but uh, it's just amazing one thing after the other is happening. Three weeks ago, I haven't told anybody except the clergy. In my office at home, I have a large Greek 18th century icon which belonged to Brother Jose. And after his death, we 
took his, many of his possessions, whatever we could, to save them from being destroyed or lost. And we're keeping them for, for, for safekeeping here and at St. Elizabeth Convent in Jordanville. Anyway, three weeks ago, I noticed that there are little wet dots on this icon. And upon closer examination, I discovered that there are at least a hundred uh, oily spots on the icon. And when Father Victorios came, uh, I, I, I touched one of these spots and I put it to my tongue and it, to me it tasted like olive oil. But when Father Nicodarius came, he, he did the same thing. He says it's bitter, which is typical of myrrh. But the interesting thing is that the, these little dots don't smell like myrrh. They're just like oil. But they're all over the icon. So again, this is another, another sign that maybe the time is coming when uh, the Mother of God wants Brother Jose finally canonized to the rank of saints. So I thought I would share that with you and come Wednesday we will pray before our copy of the Montreal icon. And now uh, please listen to the prayers of Thanksgiving of after Holy Communion. <clears throat> Save me to be a communicant of thy holy things. I thank thee that thou hast felt safe and the unworthy to partake of thy most pure and heavenly gifts. But, O oh, Master, lover of mankind, who for our sake didst die and rise again, didst bestow upon us these dread and life creating mysteries for the well being and sanctification of our souls and bodies. For the well being and sanctification of our souls and bodies, grant that these may be even to me for the healing of soul and body, for the averting of everything hostile, for the enlightenment of the eyes of my heart, for the peace of the powers of my soul, for faith unashamed, for love unfeigned, for the fullness of wisdom, for the keeping of thy commandments, for an increase of thy divine grace, and for the attainment of thy kingdom, being preserved by them in thy holiness, I may remember thy grace always, and no longer live for myself, but for thee, our master and benefactor. And thus, when I have departed this life in hope of life eternal, I may attain unto everlasting rest with the sound of them that keep festivals unceasing. The delight is endless of them that behold the ineffable beauty of thy countenance. For thou art the true desire and the unutterable gladness of them that love thee, O Christ our God. And all creation doth hymn thee unto the ages of end. O Master Christ our God, King of the ages and creator of all things, I thank thee for all the good things that thou hast bestowed upon me for the communion of thy most pure and life creating mysteries. I pray thee therefore, O good one and lover of mankind, keep me under the protection and the shadow 